For many survivors, some of whom I know personally, their college careers were irreparably altered. Their grades plummeted, they started self-medicating with alcohol and drugs, or changing their majors to avoid sharing classroom time with their perpetrators. Most refused to make a formal complaint to the college and resorted to making secret lists of men to avoid at parties and posting these lists in bathroom stalls. Sadly, in severe cases, there are survivors so distraught they took men to leave, attempted suicide, or dropped out of school. Over 20 years later, I still talked to some of these women, two of whom ended up terminating pregnancies caused by date rape, who fell so far behind in classes that despite their very bright futures, are still haunted by their past and what could have been. Despite my involvement in these groups and in this space, and my own deep understanding that it wasn't my fault, I also found myself needing to take time off from school. Starting my sophomore year, I became one of those trainers that traveled to first year dorms and continued that throughout my tenure. For many, like for me, this training and availability of campus resources came too late. They already had stories about unwanted advances by older students in frat houses at dorm parties and as part of hazing rituals. A true turning point came to me in what would have been my senior year. I walked into a fraternity house where a barely conscious woman had been hanged. To this day, I'm still haunted by the laughter of guys who were never charged with for anything. As they drunkenly left the building, saying that they were, quote, just having some fun, and other people at the party whispering that she was flirting with them, she obviously was okay with it. That was the moment I realized that no matter how much education we did, it was too little too late. My years as a college student ended in the 90s. I could tell stories for days about campus sexual assault, culture, and the cycle of violence. I could tell stories of women who had to change majors, leave campus, and take time off. And having the benefit of time, I can tell stories about the long-term lasting impact of those assaults and the ability of those women to hold down jobs, engage in healthy relationships, and reach their full potential. I'll give you a hint. Many haven't been able to do any of those things. I can also tell stories of women like me who access the available resources in the community and were able to get the interventions and help they needed in a timely fashion. Though those stories are not all perfect, many of those stories follow a more positive trajectory. When people hear a woman being violently assaulted by a man who jumps out of the woods and holds them at knife point, everyone rallies around her and wants to help. They vilify the man and scream for justice, but the reality of rape is that it's typically committed by someone known and trusted. It happens behind a closed door, maybe even a door closed consensually. There's no rally cry for these assaults. They are instead met with contempt and distress. What are you wearing? Did you actually say no? Were you drinking? Did you lead him on? These secret assaults are pervasive on college campuses, and they go undetected and unnoticed because survivors know they won't be heard, that their stories will be swept under the rug, and that their perpetrators will be allowed to continue living their lives unfazed because there is no proof.